Great relationships don't just happen. They're designed. Why leave love to chance when you can make strategic decisions in your relationship just like you do in your career? The days of settling for mediocre are over. Welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. I'm Dr. Jolie Hamilton. And I'm Ken Hamilton. Join us as we explore the decisions and choices that make relationships work no matter what life throws your way. It's time to reimagine relationships from the ground up. Welcome to Project Relationship. Hi, welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. I'm Dr. Jolie Hamilton. I'm Ken Hamilton. And we are talking this week about, uh, well, a question that someone had posed to us, a listener had posed to us about, at heart, custom designing a relationship. No cookie cutters, no, like, no preconceived notions about what it means to be married exactly. Yeah, not selecting from the... Very cultural small, menu, the very, very short, short menu, menu. of um, relationships in our culture. And so the question really was about what can we do when we are ready for a custom designed relationship? We know that we want to shift an existing relationship rather than starting a fresh one. We know we want to s- shift mm. an existing yeah. relationship into a more custom model. A lot of stuff can come up when this happens. I think it's it's a question well worth exploring. Um, I hear it from clients all the time because in fact, people seek out my help when they are looking to really dive into, hey, are we making a relationship that actually works for us? Am I asking for what I actually need? Or did we pick up the, the, the gauntlet of marriage um, or or for that matter, dating or living together Um, Do we pick up a role and then like throw it over us both and say, okay, we're going where this is it. This is what we're doing, which I think is what most of us were like. That's the only thing that was presented out there. Yeah. And the, and trying to figure out what you need as, as you mentioned is um, it can be tricky to, so is this what I need or is this what I'm told I should need? And it can be difficult to actually pin down what's going on for me as an individual. Right. So I wanted to start off by saying that we have talked about this over and over again, that there is no one right way to do relationship. There is no singular way that is better. And I have seen this proven in my own life, but I've certainly, I've seen it in book after book, especially as I studied relationships um, from the perspective of how does jealousy work in relationships? There is no one model that just works for everyone. That I can tell you for sure. I see it in my clients' relationships all the time. And most of us are actually trying to create a, a custom something but without a framework, without an idea that says, hey, I actually get to design my relationship, mm-hmm, yeah. it's all the harder. And I think what this um, listener was talking about is it is really, really challenging to even begin the conversation in a way that doesn't feel threatening. Right. So you and I have custom designed our relationship. We have. And we only knew to do that because we were both married when we fell in love. And so in order to, we had like internal pressure to do something we different. had to do something. There was a, a clear goal, a clear benefit. And we didn't take the tr- the totally, the most common route, which is that both of us would have gotten divorced immediately or have had a secret affair. Uh-huh. We didn't do either of those things. We did another thing. And I think that that for us set us up in a way to you sort of scramble the the notion that there is just a one way because we might have had a secret affair that might have been a way that yep. we had proceeded and it wasn't and i'm glad it wasn't because the thing that i got i mean though boy i really oof, there was definitely something i wanted from you but i didn't <laughs> get that and i'm not sorry because what i did get was the instigation of this this totally other imagination relationship structure in fact doesn't have to be just as simple as we're exclusive or we're not we're married or we're not we're dating or we're not we're it that dichotomous yeah. thinking when that got scrambled up for me what i realized is that i wanted 
I wanted both. And I wanted, mm -hmm. I wanted a custom mix. I wanted, I wanted to like remix it all and figure out what I wanted with you. Yeah. I wanted to step past what I saw as limitations in my own life. And I mean, it goes beyond just my relationship with you and, and my marriage at the time. I was trying to figure out how to get what I wanted in all kinds of different places. This kind of settled into the same area. So something that happened for us was a shift away from the binary thinking. Yep. And, I, you know, binary thinking has its strengths. One of its strengths is that it allows us to make quick yes and no decisions. And so when we're in a, a life threatening situation, we often will revert to that black and white life, like, like yes, no thinking that that like dichotomous thinking and it allows us to say yes i'll do this no i won't yeah. and that's about the limits of its usefulness yeah because outside of an emergency situation not seeing the nuances and the the gray areas all the all the ways that we can reimagine something that was what led us to make some of our most painful mistakes oh, yes first yes and yeah. i've had clients who found themselves in situations where that <laughs> all or nothing thinking led them to end marriages they didn't actually mean to they found yeah. you know two three four years down the road oops i'm not sure that that wait i now i'm repeating the same thing i'm not sure that was the decision i meant it to be it was the all or nothing thing that got them stuck so what i love about this listener question is it's poking a hole in the idea that there is you know, just married or not married. Yeah. Now you are a very energetic person, like mentally. You're you're always curious and reading and expanding, and you're stretching your imagination all the time. Um, and I am less so. And I know that one of the things that has gotten in the way for me is I go to, okay, there's this there's this binary option. And I'm aware that I could imagine beyond it. And sometimes that imagination feels like a lot of work. Mm. Is that anything that you ever hear from All people the time. about? Okay. All the time. So how you... that usually comes up is somebody will be struggling in multiple areas of their life. Um, often I meet with people who are, they're building a, a successful business. And so they are constantly on building, making choices. They mm. are on right and they're on fire and they're doing that and so they want desperately to have their relational life their love life mm, be, simpler. be simpler okay so they struggle when they realize oh actually it requires the same sort of high level executive functioning <laughs> um being able to dig in and and grapple with the complexities oh so would you say that it is so there you are in your business that you're building or or your career or whatever mm -hmm. it is and you're 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 reaching for um high functioning you know um you're really expertise. trying to show up you're really trying yeah. to show up and you really want to do a, a make it make it great and i hear you saying that the relationship can it can work the same way absolutely if you want it to level up like that the That's entire the, premise of okay. the work I do with people is exactly that. It's that if we applied the same, if we apply the exact same skill sets to our relational life that we apply when we are trying to build something grand or when we are solving the problems of an entrepreneurial venture or a, a, a high level, um, well, I mean, even your work, which is not entrepreneurial, but you have to solve these complex problems. Yeah. If you apply your brain to those problems, you always find these fascinating solutions and you have to imagine them into being. I have to you can't just go open being, a book. I, but I do have to be willing to open a book, like to, yeah. to gather information from multiple sources, not just my own history of the work that I do, but what else, what have other people done that I might be able to use to solve this problem? And, right. and, and, yeah. and so when my clients make the shift to approaching their relationships as, oh, if I want it to be easeful, I'm going to have to be willing to be creative and put some energy in this direction. The shift can be made, but it but it's challenging at first because I think a lot of us have 
the tendency to lean into our relating as a place of easy comfort, mm -hmm, simple mm -hmm. comfort. Yeah. Um, and it's a little bit like relying on, on junk food. Like you feel good at first. And then after a while, you're like, wow, I actually feel worse. Yeah. It kind of adds up know. to something different. Than yeah. The, yeah. And you know, like I, I love ice cream, I, but if I ate it as my primary food, I got about a day before Ooh, I'm going to feel yeah. bad. Right. When we, when you and I were struggling to find something that would actually work for us, something that was beyond the, the earlier imagination we had of being married and doing things a particular way, which meant, um, well, only having each other as sexual partners, only having each other as primary emotional partners, yeah. um, certainly not exploring the, the, the depths of sexual connection um, in multiple ways, and also only tying ourselves to a very traditional sort of idea of how we live, like what how we spend our time mm -hmm. and what we spend our time on. When we shifted away from that, the thing that I found the most useful and the thing that I recommend people do as early as possible is find a label that works for the two of you. Find a new label mm -hmm. and create shared meaning around that. Because I think when we, you and I really, we weren't sure about the married thing for a long time. Yeah. It took us a while to get, and even after we signed the paper, we didn't use those words very much at all. And I use them sometimes now, but not all the time. Creating our new partnership, our our new relationship around a word that worked for us, which the word was partner for us. Yeah. Um, I referred to you as my partner with a lot of intention. And I've had a lot of people ask me why I do that. And my reason is because I always want to center the fact that you are a partner for me, whether we are married or not, whether we are yeah. having sex or not. Um, we decided to do this thing together and to negotiate future changes um, in a way that would allow us to remain partnered in some ways. Like, for instance, we really enjoy parenting our children together. Mm -hmm. I want to do that even if for some reason we decide that we're not sexually compatible anymore. Or if we decide that we don't want to share living space yeah. for some reason, um, which I happen to love sharing living space with you right now, but life changes, but but, things but, happen. Yeah, assuming that things won't change. Planning for things not to change makes some fairly inflexible plans that can cause Flexibility, trouble. so that's the other thing that comes to mind right away is, most of us, when we make our agreements, our relationship agreements, we focus on what we're agreeing to do. We forget to take into account how are we going to deal with the inevitable changes mm -hmm. in personhood. Like we aren't going to be the same people down the road, let alone the, all the external circumstances that are going to change. How are we going to deal with changes? What's our flexibility plan? Right. Yeah. What's and our that's ad adaptation plan. Our adaptation plan. So, yeah. so finding a shared word that can allow you to co-create meaning that sets you off of the this this dichotomy of married or not married is a great first step. And then actively imagining how you'll be flexible, how you will deal with the reality yeah. that we are changing and growing. That and actually when, puts you on the individuation path where you are now. You're growing and changing intentionally. Learning about your own self and what, yeah, how you're put together. But you had a, um, you had a pretty interesting experience with this, in fact, because personally, so you were married when you and I fell in yep. love, and um, with all intentions to stay married, because you had what was a an open marriage, a, a, a flexible, yep. a, a flexible monogamish agreement. So. I would love to hear you explain how that went for you because you did go through the process of intentionally getting a divorce so that you'd move out of the marriage part. And then what happened for you? Well, um, so for me, since the, I mean, it, it has to do with imagination so much. I mean, the, the, the marriage appeared to be getting in the way of living the life I wanted. 
like the, the way the marriage was showing up for me. So I was like, okay, we'll get divorced. And this wasn't just you deciding. No. You didn't announce no, this. No, this was a, a mutual endeavor. Um, we decided to get a divorce. And what I hadn't done was plan what was going to happen after. That's tough. And so you were asking what my experience was. My experience was um, that I, I didn't define for myself uh, who I was relationally to you, to her. So, I was, and, yeah, I was just thinking about how when we make plans like that, and because I was there, I was around, I was not part of that decision. I couldn't be. I wasn't the one married. But I watched you decide very clearly what you didn't want anymore. Yeah. All of us, it appeared, were demonizing marriage. We had thrown, huh, we were using yeah. marriage as a scapegoat. Yep. And we were like, marriage, the institution of marriage is the problem. Let's, and we threw a whole lot of junk onto that scapegoat. Yep. And then we tried to execute it. And then, so we did, except there was a problem. We never decided what we were moving toward. That's right. And without that, uh, well, it took years to figure out what we were building. And so because we didn't we didn't talk about what we were building, so we couldn't build it together. So there's a there's a place where the business mindset is actually incredibly helpful. Hmm. If if I make a new company and I am trying not to be a bunch of things, <laughs> but I have no idea what my offer is, what my what my how I want to interact with people, what my, my, how I'm going to source leads and I'm going to like, int what would I be doing exactly? I mean, that doesn't even sound. How would you spend your time? What, yeah. what business would I even <laughs> right. have? Yep. It, that makes, that's nonsense. And yet we do that in relationships all the time. We yeah. just, we seek out a person and forget that the beginning of a relationship, like finding a person who you want to relate to is the beginning of getting to know how you relate to them. Right. Not the end it's not oh yay we got married there it's okay what are we doing yeah and then a co-creative process and i'm i'm a technician at heart um or at least part of my heart and so i i think about okay and i, I wish i had been thinking about this. this is what i wasn't doing around my divorce what do i need what do i want what does the institution of marriage provide out of that list? Mm -hmm. What's left and what am I going to do about that? Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, there, there are cultural issues around that too, which we run across a little, but not, well, I don't know, maybe, maybe you do more than I do. You talk to more people, but um, people don't ask me a lot what my relationship with you was like. Right. And if they did, I would have to, Thing. I can't just say, well, you know, it's a typical marriage. It's not. It's a bunch of other things. And if I really wanted to engage in the topic, there'd be all these things to talk about. Um, but then there'd be all these things to talk about. Which would be so kind of fun. You, you just said you were a technician and that made me think about how, you know, the people I work with, and I think a lot of our listeners, we're optimizers. Optimizers. We're people yeah. who are trying to live not just a life, but an excellent life mm -hmm. or in old CrossFit speak, uh, a, a life of virtuosity and yeah. aimed at virtuosity. Mm -hmm. And so this isn't about whether you want to be married or, or unmarried or single or solo polyamorous or, or polyfidelic. It's not that it's about, do you want to move toward the best version of yourself as a relational creature? Mm -hmm. And sometimes when we're in pain, and I'm guessing that the listener who asked this question, I'm guessing that there's some pain because a shift in relationship styles requires a grieving process. Yeah. There, and it, even for me, when I thought, oh gosh, I thought I'd already grieved my pain around the loss of my first marriage. No, I needed to, to dig into it. I needed to explore it fully. I needed to write about it. I went to a therapist about it. Then when I was ready to, I ritually released oh, yeah. that marriage. I, I I made an intentional point of of pulling together a full ceremony because it was necessary for me to to create an end so that I could fully grieve that loss, even though I chose it. Yeah, choosing it doesn't mean you don't have to grieve it. And so, if we start with acknowledging the grief and the loss, and and then. What are we going to move forward to? Yeah. 
there can be a real, um, a real shift, a real, um, yeah, an evolution of the relationship. And that was something that I, as a witness to your first marriage ending, um, we didn't see that. We didn't see, I didn't witness a ritual ending. No. I didn't ri- witness a communal grieving or a separate grieving. There was a little bit from you. There was a, there was, there was like one clear evening of deep grieving yep. and you ritually closed I, some I, of it. I did some of that. And, um, but there wasn't a moving toward, right. Which had yep. been the original intention. Yep. And cause a ritual, there's a ritual endings and ritual beginnings too. Right. And I definitely did not do any kind of ritual beginning, which would have been very useful, I think, for me. And I work with clients all the time on this exact thing. I'm on, hey, we have moments of new beginning all the time. Let us, I, I was just working with somebody recently who was repairing a relationship. Um, it was a, a polyamorous relationship with actually really well thought out agreements. But still, sometimes things happen. Some stuff happened that caused some discord. And when it did part of the healing was figuring out how they come back together. And frequently during the process, we worked together for about seven months. And during that process, or six months, I guess, there were these these milestones where it was obvious from the outside that we needed to acknowledge the transformation as it was happening, the steps, the transitions that they were going to. They were grief moments. Of, of deep acknowledgement needed some some separation was needed some emotional and physical separation to allow the distance to let them see not only each other more clearly but to turn toward self capital s self yeah. and have an experience of self renewal and grief and then to mark these transitions, it wasn't just, oh, here's a magic day where now everything's different. No, right. it, it was actually, there were three different times when I went through the notes on this particular case, there were three times where they needed to mark the, this, this is a transition moment for us. We are making this decision and here's how we're moving forward. And I always recommend that people take a, make a physical, you know, take a physical object and, mm-hmm. and, and imbue it with some some meaning so you know a rock a, a stone anything to something to a remind you a touchstone exactly and yeah. then set aside the right amount of time you know give yourself an hour or two to 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 do this thing a ritual only has to take a few a few minutes or a few seconds even yeah but set yourself a container to fully acknowledge and then yeah acknowledge the full humanness of being in this process together it is gloriously beautiful to watch someone reimagine their relationship. It's it's spectacular. I I am so You've lucky to get to do experiences the work people that I do. Change and develop yeah. themselves toward their best self. Yeah. I wanted to talk about grief a little bit, which you've mentioned a few times. One of the things that can keep people in place is avoiding grief. Oh, yeah. Like I can see grief coming if I if I go down this path and I want to avoid it, and I I've I've heard things that I know there are studies about um, humans uh, will resist change, even changes that are subjectively in their own opinion better for them. Mm-hmm. They will resist that, and I think that's related to the fact that we will grieve things that we are done with and don't like anymore and don't yeah. want anymore, but we'll still grieve them because they're part of our memories. They're part of our past. They're part of us. And we're saying, I'm going to do things different now. Yeah. And that can, that can be, um, I can feel like an obstacle to overcome the, the feeling of that grief and the avoidance of the grief, the avoidance of the grief. And so sometimes we're in anticipatory grief mm-hmm. where we're, we're anticipating it and we might be moving, we might be doing a lot of, um, you know, coping behaviors, ones that are supportive or not, um, yeah. just trying to avoid the feeling of it of in anticipation. But then there's also the, yeah, we might avoid noticing the, the transformation that's happening anyways. It's happening, it's happening anyway. Anyways. Yeah, this right. happened for me that's around really death several times. The death was occurring. You know, watching my brother die was a long, slow process. It was happening. Not noticing it didn't stop it from happening. Right. And in fact, acknowledging it mindfully was what allowed us to, well, to do it better. And by the way, it's not just death. It's also birth. 
Oh, sure. There oh you my are. Gosh. You're, you're, my wife is pregnant. I have nine months to prepare for the birth. I have a choice. Do I engage in the change that's happening so that when the birth comes, it's part of what's already happening? Or do I just avoid the noticing of the change, the feeling of, I mean, grief for like, the lost life or happens. whatever, I'll... or just deal with it when it happens. I, it's a choice. Um, and it, it comes with a completely different set of experiences. And I would make the, the judgment that, you know, acknowledging and consciously moving toward just noticing those very real transitions in life is part of being on an individuation yeah. path, a, a growth, a path of self determination or actualization that noticing is a, an absolutely critical piece yeah when we when we decide that we'll simply respond or react to what happens when it happens there are th situations where that is ideal but we also miss out on getting to know ourselves better yeah. in the process yep let alone all the actual logistical details and all the planning and stuff that can go much better. I mean, I remember you coming home from having twins and not having bought a minivan that would actually let you put the twins and your first child into it so, so that you could drive the them home can happen from the hospital until they were born. To let things just kind of ride for a while. Yep. I remember we thinking, had to, what was that? We had to squeeze the two new car seats in among next to the third car seat in a car that it did not fit. Yeah. So we had... But you'd been pregnant the whole nine the months. The whole time. And we knew how many kids were coming. We had the car seats. But the we never put all three of them into the yeah. car at the same time. And acknowledging that change, I remember asking funny. you about it. It was one of so my... So funny. Pre, pre us being romantic, that was one of my funniest memories of you standing <laughs> yeah. there going, well, I bought a minivan. Because there was no other solution. Nope. And there's just these like four day old babies. Yeah. Like, I mean, we, we got home from okay. the hospital and there was, I was never going to drive like that again. I think it was safe. We just had to, I mean, it just wasn't good for the car. We had to cram the doors closed. Not, and then we got home and like, oh yeah, we can't drive them away until like buy a new car. <laughs> I think so that So I didn't was... get the color I wanted. Oh, there. You did pay a little price. Oh, I absolutely a paid a price. price. I have hated the color of that car since the second <laughs> I bought it. <laughs> well, so I think that practically speaking, though, there are some more things we can talk about here. Mm. Um, I think that when, when, we're, when we're trying to encourage our partner to change and grow with us, something I found really helpful is looking for examples where we have been willing to be iconoclasts yeah. where we've been willing to be out on a ledge or Rebels. doing something rebellious. Yeah. Right. So for me, um, I would often look back and say, Hey, you know what? I homeschooled way back before it was before people really did hipster that sort of thing. I was, uh, yeah. I mean, not in the seventies, like that was real hipster homeschooling, but I was homeschooling in the early two thousands and I didn't know anybody who was at first. I was just out there like, I'm going to do this. And when I later needed to try to talk my husband into going out on some limbs with me, I would often say like, hey, we do this thing. We do this thing and it makes us different. And sometimes we feel a little outcast. Sometimes we feel like we don't fit in society, but here's a place where it's actually working beautifully for us. Yeah, and that was really helpful. helpful. It's also helpful to read and see and hear stories of other people doing. Oh yeah. Um, either something similar to what you're thinking about doing or just doing things differently and, and hearing about how it goes. And there's where I helps think the imagination. Exactly. I think that more people sharing transparently what their mm -hmm. relationship, what their marriage for that matter looks like. Cause I don't think this is about the piece of paper. This is about what you, what you actually do on the other side of that piece of paper, whether that piece of paper is a marriage license or a divorce decree doesn't matter. What are you going to do? Yeah. And if more people shared what they really do, what we would have a more varied is. relationship imagination. Yeah. And that I think would be an incredibly healthy thing for our society as a yes. whole, because we have people listening right now, I'm sure, who just didn't know that there were other ways to do things. Yeah. And then you make stuff up as you go along. And some of it is gold. Some yep. of you are sitting yep. on solid gold relational tools, techniques, ideas, 
innovations. We want to know. We told. What did, I, what did you come up I with? I do. I want to know so much. I want to know so so much. Yeah. Um, and I think that, and so seriously, write to me. You can always yeah, write to me your relationship story. Jolie at JolieHamilton.com. You're always welcome to email me. Um, I want to talk a little bit further about one last thing that I think is super, super important. So this last thing is identity. Okay. Marriage is a, is one of the very few rituals, ritual transitions mm. that we have in this culture. Right. Um, and I, you know, I, I watch, I'm actually, <laughs> I'm watching a lot of um, young people. I have, I happen to be spending time with a bunch of people in their mid twenties right now. And I'm watching them get engaged and go through the steps right. yeah. of, of moving from single, unmarried, you know, dating to engaged and married. And it is such a treat. You can see the identity transformation. In fact, I was just sitting in a class and three people in the class had just announced that they had gotten engaged in the last like three month or people, so. Wow. Yeah. And it was, it was actually really fun to, to, to feel like we were in physical space together, which was great. And you could feel how they're their their own self image had shifted. There was a transformation happening. There was a change. They were imagining into who who am I now? I'm an engaged person. I am a person about to get married. I we don't have a lot of <laughs> we don't have a lot of options when we think about the identity of someone in relationship. But I'll tell you, there's one that annoys me a lot. When I had to shift into choosing specifically divorced on forms oh it was so strange yeah not single divorced yeah like well but married was still a thing so then when i got married again then i went to married so i went single married divorced married that's kind of weird it feels yeah, weird I, see the... I, I don't know exactly what they're gathering this information for on all these forms but it makes me think about how identity so in like it, it it impacts on a cellular level who we are, yeah. what we're doing, and what we can imagine as possible. And so, what's one of the reasons affirmations work, right? Because you're you're telling yourself a new story, yeah, over exactly. and over until that becomes you. So, if you want a new relationship, and I again, this isn't about like choose. You could choose just a you know something quite quote unquote standard, but if you want a relationship that is custom designed for you, choosing your identity is a key part of that. Just like it is. So I come out of the closet over and over and over again because I remind people that in fact, I'm queer. I, I'm i I'm not straight, never was. But because I'm married to you and most people see me as like in relation to you, I am often put into that box. So I come out over and over again. And the reason I do is because that identity matters to me yeah. it is who i am and i feel invisible and weird and and stressed my body feels stressed when i don't feel seen when we don't know who it is we are because we'd feel so unseen and we can't even see us yeah that is rough that is rough and so so in any relationship um i think i want to be seen for who i am in that relationship which means knowing what the relationship is and what my place is in it. So allowing ourselves to invent new terms, new words, yeah. and to define those. Hey, maybe you want to use an old term. You identify, you use pronouns he, him. You're comfortable with they. I mean, we, both of us are, but you use the he, him pronouns. But haven't you been redefining what man means for you? Yeah. Like I mean, for a while. I have been uncomfortable with being called a man since I was a child it's like it never quite sat right, right from with me nice little man <laughs> yeah yeah um i never came up with anything different until recently <laughs> which is uh yeah it only took um, like 54 years yeah. it's fine uh, but i but i had to come up with a new word yeah that made more sense for me yeah which i'm still a little uncomfortable using in public just because it means something to me. I don't know what it means to everybody else. Well, there's the thing. We actually all 
we get to figure out, we get to identify and then explain, but it might not feel that way. We get to explain. We get to explain yeah. our identities to people. However, we live in a culture. That culture has not really fully gotten on board with the fact that all identities really need, they, they warrant explanation. You know, I have I have clients who are of different racial backgrounds, different cultural backgrounds, different religious backgrounds, different orientations, different gender identities. And it doesn't matter whether I've had them fill out a form to explain this or not. I need them to tell me, what do those things mean to you? We are a meaning making people. Like that's what people are. We're meaning makers. But we don't automatically share each other's meanings. Right. So we have to find out. I think the co-creation of these words. And allowing ourselves to be in the in-between of playing with, hey, I'm going to try on this identity. I don't know whether it's the right, right mm -hmm. one for me yet. Yeah, we don't. you don't have to go from I am certain I am this to I am certain I am this new thing. No. That's not necessary. So or I think my answer then for this listener's question is the liminal space, the in-between. Mm -hmm. They are currently ex describing a situation to me that is liminal space. We're not this and we're not that. What will it be? Right now, probably uncomfortable. Yeah. We've been in a relationship where we prioritized growth over comfort yes. intentionally from the, be yeah. from the beginning. But at first, I hated it. I hated it. Oh, yeah. It drove me insane to have to be uncomfortable all the time. Yeah. Uncomfortable, unsure, not sure what's and going it, on. But... And worse, it felt unreal. I felt like I wasn't mm. in a real relationship. Oh, yeah. Right. That, because you don't have the cultural standing, the cultural backing yeah. of whatever it is you're doing. Okay. So I'm just going to say permission. Permission to be in the in-between. Oh, yes. Permission to not know yet, to be in the exploration. I want you to collect memories of times when you have stepped out into this in-between space or taken a risk and said, I don't know exactly how this is going to go, but we're going to figure it out because some part of this relationship matters so much to me that I'm willing to be in the discomfort yeah. and grow alongside you, whether that be parallel, whether that be all tangled up and intertwined, whether that be separate and we, and we carefully say our goodbyes so that we can do this better in other ways. Your imagination is the only Your thing holding you back. Is, and and it's and it will hold what's next too. Yeah, it will. This is a huge topic. It is. I love talking about this particular topic. I am super excited to hear if anyone out there has done something creative in describing their relationship identity. Oh yes. What words are you using? Yeah. How are you creating your life? tell me I, and if you want to hop on the on the phone with me just to connect and talk about it i absolutely like will you can email me and we can set up a virtual coffee chat because this is where we figure out how relationship will look going forward and not backward yes and i i am an optimist it's part of you my are. shtick <laughs> but i don't this is i'm not sure this is optimism my experience of what we have done that in that liminal space it can be very uncomfortable Absolutely. You have to open up your imagination. But then working with you, my partner, on what we were going to do was tremendously exciting. Like, And part of me, as being me, thought he was going to have to do it all on his own and then bring it to you. Right. Huh. Well, first of all, that's not going to work in a relationship. But second of all, releasing that and saying, I like it to be with you and be with you working on it was amazing and still is. Yeah. We will definitely pick this up and, and do another yeah. round of talk on this topic. We have some other questions coming up. You can look forward to hearing about how to organize or plan for having a threesome or moresome or playing out in the world, or maybe just talking about the fantasy of it. Do, we'll yeah. also be talking about how to deal with family members who meddle in your relationship or who are causing problems. And we're going to talk about what happens when you're not growing at the same pace as your partner and what to do with the discomfort of that. So those are just some of the questions that have come up recently in some episodes you can keep look forward to hearing. But keep bringing the questions to us. Again, you can always email me, jolie at joliehamilton.com. And yeah, thanks for listening, everybody.
Bye. Thank you for listening to the Project Relationship Podcast with Dr. Jolie Hamilton and Ken Hamilton. If you're enjoying our conversation, we would be so grateful if you would drop a rating and quick review so more people will be able to find us. And if you have questions or suggestions that you of things you'd like us to tackle, please send an email to Jolie at JolieHamilton.com. I'd love to hear them. Project Relationship, the Entrepreneur's Action Plan for Passionate, Sustainable Love is available on Amazon in Kindle, soft, or hardcover versions. This book is a succinct, practical guide to improving your love life. I wrote Project Relationship to give you a set of quick action tools and conversation guides that can transform a mediocre relationship into a fabulous one. These tools are based not just on what Jolie learned in her studies, but on what we actually do to make our relationship thrive. Until next time, remember, relationships can be messy, and that's good news.